really think about what it is you want to come out with. And also, where do you work best? There are some people who are great business people that should never, ever have a boss. And if you know that about yourself, self-fund and search may be the way to go. So you're talking about a decade of your life that's invested in this and you really want to make sure you're going down the right path. My big concern is that business sellers may wait too late to sell their business. If you're a small to mid-sized business owner, your business is running relatively well and you're thinking you might sell in five years, think about selling it today. Karen Spencer, thank you for once again coming on our podcast. It was really nice chatting with you. It's been almost a year since our last conversation. Uh, you have a storied experience, uh, an amazing academic profile, and you're a, a founding member and former chief operating officer of Search Funder, which is uh, one of the main um, hubs of knowledge exchange in the ETA or search fund space. Uh, could you, continuing on our conversation from several months ago, could you tell us what's been going on in the search fund space? How has the ecosystem been changing? You know, it's evolving every day. And I think uh, in many ways, most rapidly in the US, which you probably could expect since it grew out of the US. We're uh, seeing a lot more folks who are genuinely interested in owning a profitable, stable, small to mid-sized business, a lot more in the US. And more people are more familiar with search funds and acquisition entrepreneurship more broadly. So that is bringing more people into the space to provide services, uh, to provide dollars in the term in terms of debt and also equity from investors. So it's a, a lot going on. Um, recently, there was a recent post about the diligence fund uh, happening, and that is a relatively recent innovation um, that looks like it's about to get standardized. I've heard of pockets of people doing it, and I'll explain what that means. So. Typically, you've had self-funded searchers, which means that they pay for their own searching for a business to buy. They paid for the due diligence of the business, and then they sought primarily debt and maybe some investor money to purchase the business. The idea behind self-funded was that you'd own 80% and above of the business. Then you also had traditional search or uh, also called core searching now. And that was where a pool of investors would pay for you to go search for a business to buy and you would purchase that business. And as you met certain hurdles, you would receive about 25% equity in the company. Your investors would receive 75%. And then there was that tweener called Accelerator or Incubator as well. Now what we're seeing is you, a new flavor coming in. So we have uh, folks who are self-funded searchers. Maybe they find a bigger business where it makes sense to bring in investors and it's a little risky to do the due diligence because when you buy a bigger business, it ends up being that the due diligence gets a little bit more expensive. You don't want to do that on a shoestring. So now investors are inclined to help the searcher out by creating a diligence fund to diligence, diligence the business that they're about to buy. So it's if you're willing to be creative in this space, it feels like you can get your needs met. It sounds like each of those models is um, better for different people. So some people might benefit from the self-funded model more than the core model as the traditional model has been re renamed or rebranded. Um, and you yourself have, have, you know, you're known as a mentor in this space, um, well-connected. Uh, do you see any changes to the accelerator or incubator model? 
I'm not hearing of much. I, we we had a growth in accelerators and incubators a few years ago. Uh, I haven't heard of any new ones uh, really popping to the floor yet. Uh, I, I'm curious to see if we can get some data on the results of those accelerators and incubators. I've heard of course, pluses and minuses for all of the models. And what I would say to anybody who's looking at uh, doing a search for a small to medium sized business is to really think about what it is you want to come out with. And also, where do you work best? There are some people who are great business people that should never ever have a boss. And if you know that about yourself, self-funded search may be the way to go. There's some people who like a more collaborative or team environment when they're doing something as stressful as trying to figure out what kind of business that they want to buy or they may want some more support. All of these paths have their trade-offs. I, I get um, most, uh, I think, saddest when I hear of somebody who went down a path and then they get into it and realize it was the wrong one. And I think that sometimes it happens where um, you may not have that confidence that you need. And so you feel like you should not take the, you take the path of least resistance is that, I guess how I would put it. Cause I've heard of traditional searchers who wish they had gone self-funded and self-funded who wish they had gone traditional core search or, you know, and incubated who wish they'd done either, or I've heard of, I've heard of uh, those regrets. Now sometimes there are regrets of the path not taken, but sometimes there are the, the regrets of the wrong path taken and uh, searching is, generally about two years of, of searching for a business to buy. And then once you operate that business, you've got another probably five to seven years. So you're talking about a decade of your life that's invested in this and you really want to make sure you're going down the right path. Great advice. I imagine that one way to make that choice better for yourself is perhaps uh, approaching a mentor or taking a class? Do you have any advice for how someone can, in a way, sample these different models to figure out which one aligns more with who they are? I think there's a, a, a couple of ways you could do it. And I, this is not meant to be solely a plug for my ETA Launch Hub, but it's a, a great and structured way for doing that. You can also interview uh, a ton of active searchers, investors, uh, and, and try to find those. They're a little quieter, but try to find those who were not able to achieve what they sought out to achieve, whether it's they weren't able to buy a business um, or the business that they bought was perhaps the wrong one for them or uh, bad timing on the business that they bought and they struggled. I, I have heard privately of instances where somebody bought a perfectly good business and then something happens within the first couple of years of acquisition that really makes it a struggle. And as you, as you know, David, entrepreneurship, it, when it goes well, is a daily struggle. And when you're adding the complexities of, uh, of the financial side not working out the way that you think it would, it's even worse. Definitely. It's kind of an impossible question to answer, but I'll ask anyway. Are there any industries that you see are like any trends? I, I remember a year ago or so, or maybe it's a bit more than that now, HVAC was all the rage. Um, with Are there certain industries that lend themselves to the search fund model better than others? Or is it really just a matter of right person, right team, right place, right time? There are popular industries and they are... I think forever popular. So particularly the US like landscaping, security companies, healthcare is coming more to the fore. I recently did a uh, one minute news on the industries that searchers are most interested in researching on search funder through their ibis world reports and i i did a couple of uh looks around the globe of who was interested in what so these are all great industries to be in i think searchers need to decide 
if it's a great industry for them. And I think in the US, you really have to dive down to the, I would say, sub-sub industry sector level in the US. Pre-pandemic, you could kind of be fairly broad, fairly agnostic in the US about what you were searching for and people would get it. Now, I think people are looking for a lot more definition around that. So I don't want to just know whether you're HVAC. I want to know what kind of HVAC company and where and why you think that uh, you should be running that business. Speaking of broad, you studied chemical engineering at MIT, law at Harvard, business at Stanford, worked for Nike, uh, had a stint in politics, worked as a patent attorney in Silicon Valley. Uh, I could see that a trajectory might have been to remain in the startup world or venture capital or something like that. What made you interested in search funds? You know, I, I, I as you said, I, I love to experiment with my life. I love to go where my mind sort of leads me, where the opportunities might be. When it came to uh, about 10 years ago, I was really burnt out. I took some time off. I realized that I did not want to go big company. Nike was one of the best companies in the world to work for. So, and I knew I didn't want to do uh, ma and pop uh, as well. I had plenty of friends with coffee shops and my husband's a musician. I spent time in bars and I didn't think my strength was going to be in that sector. And I really felt like um, a small to mid-sized business that, uh, you know, could provide for me and my family was the way to go. Fortunately, back then, there really wasn't a structure for being able to do that. So that's how I landed into the startup entrepreneurship space was trying to make space for other people to be able to realize that dream of business ownership. I see. That does make sense. And you were at uh, more actively involved in Search Funder for about seven years. Uh, is that correct? Yep. Uh, yep. About seven plus. Yeah. yeah. And you're still, of course, well connected w with yeah. the, the crew there. Yeah. Uh, but you've got your own venture, um, Pipeline Prep and Fetch Strategies. Uh, can you talk to us a bit about how that started and how it's been going? Yeah. Uh, so the so when we started Search Funder, there was no Search Fund community whatsoever. And for many businesses, it's kind of easy to identify your customer. Identifying people who want to buy businesses is a little trickier. So, and if you can't identify your customer, you need your customer to be able to identify you. For instance, uh, plumbing, for instance. So my pipes go out, I know to call a plumber. But if you want to buy a business, it's a little bit harder. Who do I call? What do I do? Particularly back in what seems like uh, the ice age in uh, the mid-teens. So at that time, it was really about creating a community around which services could be built. Fast forward seven plus years, there's tons of information. There's community available. It's growing like hotcakes. Now the issue is what's good information? What's a really good way of going about this? And now that we've got more options for prospective business buyers, how do they pick one in an organized fashion? So I, I constructed uh, Fetch Strategies and then the Student Portal Pipeline Prep around that theme. My avatar was really the career-minded person having a day job who uh, was looking to do what I had wanted to do, which was maybe jump from corporate into my own business ownership. My thesis was to keep that person in their day job for as long as possible so that when they actually launch their search, whether it was traditional accelerated or incubated or self-funded, they were at kind of the peak or approaching peach peak of ramping up. There's with any business enterprise, there's a huge ramp up curve. And I feel like folks, and I've done it myself in the startup space, um, folks in who start out any endeavor uh, underestimate the amount of time that it takes for that. So that's 
in part why the ETA Launch Hub was created was to fulfill that need of getting that ramp up going. My ultimate thesis is to be able to invest in the searchers that go through the ETA Launch Hub and uh, be able to support them as much as possible. And you've had three cohorts go through the Launch Hub so far, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When is the next cohort due to launch? It is going to happen at the end of January. Applications will start opening up in October for the students. And it generally goes about 90 days. Okay. And what type of profile should the ideal candidate have? Is there anything in particular that um, you're looking for as far as the, the community? So for the ETA Launch Hub, I am looking for all types of people from all over the globe. Uh, Generally, you've got to be industrious, uh, good to work with uh, in general. Uh, I do index a fair amount on people who pay it forward, meaning that the type of person that is going to give back to their the communities in which they live and work and will own their business. That makes sense. Do you have any success stories of any of your uh, alumni? Yes, yes, we 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 have had uh, an acquisition uh, within the cohort. And remember, our cohorts were I'm um, trying to get people really, really early. So we're just starting to see the acquisitions flow through, and it's just uh, so incredibly exciting to watch. I I. I do believe in the power of diversity. So I feel like these uh, diverse cohorts will really help strengthen the searchers overall as they uh, share knowledge and learnings amongst each other. That's great. And are you planning to launch your own accelerator or your own fund at some point? I would like to launch my own fund at some point. Uh, right now, I'm in the baby steps. I've got a, a, a plan. I have a thesis, everything else, and I just need that to come together a little bit more. I, what I want to build is a track record of success with the ETA Launch Hub and also in investing in my own searchers. So. Uh, that that's kind of the stage one, and then we'll move from there. So you're coming up on a decade in this space, if not already. Um, do you see this? I know there's the great wealth transfer and the silver tsunami, and they say roughly over 20 years, maybe we're halfway into that now, there'll be somewhere between 60 to $80 trillion changing hands, and a fair portion of that is in the um, small to medium-sized business space. And much of that doesn't have a succession plan in place and may not be uh, noticed or attracted by um, private equity. And so there is somewhat of a crisis um, in like making sure that those companies survive um, and a huge investment opportunity. But that's been, that's been being said for a number of years now. Do you see this as continuing to grow for the foreseeable future or do you see some sort of plateau or even drop off in five to 10 years? I'm curious about like, what your perspective is. I think it depends upon what country you're in. I think uh, you know, the US has much room still to maneuver, but we are also seeing more private equity come into the space. Uh, as VCs, the world seems to have just crashed and burned in recent years. We're seeing more VC people come in. There are concerns, at least in the U.S., that over the long term, some of the you know 30% returns we've been seeing on the traditional core search fund vehicle may start dropping down. And I mean, if you're only dropping a little bit up below 30%, <laughs> it's still probably a really great day for most people uh, in, in terms of a, an investment vehicle. So I think in the U.S., where there's going to be more competition, more people coming in, if I were a searcher, I'd really be thinking about not just where the money is coming from, but what also is attached to that money. Is, is the money going to be bringing knowledge and ability to mentor me and to help me grow that business and sustain that business? Uh, on the 
you were talking more macroeconomic, my big concern on the overall thesis, which has proven to be true, is that business sellers may wait too late to sell their business. Um, I'm more often hearing about, oh, this would have been a great business to have bought in 21 um, or 22. Now the, you know, the person, and this just happens as you get older, has had some sort of a circumstance, an illness, a divorce, um, a family uh, incident where they've had to take their eye off the ball of their business in order to deal with that thing. And so the business isn't running at top form. So I would say if you're a small to mid-sized business owner, your business is running relatively well, and you're thinking you might sell in five years, think about selling it today. That's really interesting. I haven't heard of that take before, but it does make a lot of sense. I heard uh, something similar when I went to the Harvard ETA conference. One of the panelists in one of the um, discussions was asked, um, with managing employees, like uh, the hard conversation around firing, like when do you uh, fire an employee? And uh, one guy had a con one of the panelists had a controversial take or polarizing take, and he said, as soon as the thought crosses your mind. Um, and so, similarly, uh, when you when your business is going great, maybe you're not thinking of selling, but uh, you know, if it crosses your mind, probably now is a good time. Uh, that, that's what I would say. At least you, you don't have to commit to it, but at least get on the path towards it. Uh, particularly if, as many people who are business owners, they're looking at the exit to be the thing that maintains them in their retirement and the lifestyle that they've always dreamed about. So th the best exit you can have is when your business is working well. I'm not even saying perfectly when it's working well, when you're starting to lose key employees, when you're starting to lose key customers, it becomes a lot more difficult to make that transfer. Yeah, I imagine you have more options when things are going well. So even if you're somewhat attached to the company at that point, uh, it, it's still worth perhaps seeing what some of those options might be. You mentioned uh, VC somewhat uh, conflating. Uh, do you, and maybe some of those uh, investors now coming into the ETA space, do you see, uh, obviously there's somewhat of a different model here with, with VC, you're taking, um, you're kind of swinging for the fences on, um, in some sense, unproven or less proven business models, whereas in the ETA space, usually there's recurring revenue and perhaps uh, they've even weathered a few recessions. Like some of these companies might be a decade or a couple of decades old. Um, so a little bit different in that respect. But do you see like a cultural difference um, in the investors that invest in ETA space versus VC, broadly speaking? I have not seen it yet. I'm expecting it to come. And what are some things to maybe be aware of? Um, I'm sure anything is addressable, but what are some things that... Uh, you know, people should be aware of if they're um, a new searcher, perhaps, uh, and approaching different investors and they need money, but they're also looking for that alignment. And maybe they have someone that has a lot of experience in VC and maybe someone that has a lot of experience um, in micro private equity. Um, what are some things that they might want to consider? The first would be time horizon. What is the time horizon of your investor? Are they looking to get out in three years, five years? Would they be comfortable if you held the company for the rest of your life? And what is the exit that they're looking at? My supposition is that the more VC standard somebody is, the faster they're probably going to want to get out than not. And if they're coming from PE, they're probably going to have some pretty set metrics. The search fund space tends to lean, I think, be a little bit more biased to longer term holds. In fact, they've done some research on the traditional or core search fund model suggesting that holding the businesses longer would actually net better returns for their investors. So know the time horizon because if somebody needs to get out early, uh, you may be doing some things to fund their getting out that then don't go back into the business. The other, which I mentioned earlier, is knowledge base. The search fund space really grew up around each cohort 
broadly speaking, of searchers mentoring the ones that came behind them, the investors providing mentorship. And that mentorship looks very, very different uh, from a searcher perspective, from a search fund investor perspective, and then from a new investor coming in from, say, the VC world. I, I wrote a piece on this on my blog. Uh, I think searchers are looking for Mr. Miyagi. Uh, my experience with uh, in is is limited in the VC world, but my experience in the VC world is like a quick coffee or conversation might be mentoring. I wouldn't call it that, but I like that like just getting time with the investor. Uh, and it, if that is the case, then you're going to want to use that time effectively, of course. And then in the search fund space, the mentoring has been more of knowledge transfer and knowledge sharing. Uh, and it does feel like as the investors get bigger and bigger stables of searchers and operators, that that is diminishing, as I've heard calls for more younger operators to start stepping up onto boards of companies to help provide that mentoring. I see. You mentioned earlier that the time horizon is maybe changing in the search fund space. We're holding on to a company for longer uh, yields better returns. Uh, what does that look like? Is that beyond the five to seven years into maybe 10 years and beyond? I, I, that's my supposition. Like rather than five to seven, you're looking at seven to 10. Uh, and, and for a searcher, the investors you have that help you buy the company and get you through you know, day one to year three, may be different than the investors that you want from year three to seven, and may be different than the investors that you want on your board year seven to 10, right? And as you're thinking about building your board, you may, be th you may need to think about that long-term uh, time horizon, if that's what you want. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't really considered, uh, it's almost like uh, sports where they bring in like different players at different times of, of the game. Uh, strategically to give them an advantage. Exactly. And you may be looking at that with your employee base as well. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to you and Fetch Strategies and your ETA Knowledge Hub, how is what you do different than a lot of the other um, accelerators and uh, cohorts that you might see popping up uh, around the world? So uh, first, I'm a pre-accelerator, so I am helping you get ready for all of the other stuff that comes later. And I really try to base this not on just one individual's experience, but on the thousands of conversations I have every year with everybody across the search fund community, hundreds of interviews, and I also built my own video library, which is called Vault, which is now accessible to the public, to be able to do research. And I pull in, besides the search fund knowledge, I really try to pull in strategic planning, go to market strategy, some of the things that folks are missing uh, when they search. So everybody will come out of the program with a solid foundation on the fundamentals and and then they'll be able to proceed down whichever path they want to choose whether whichever model that they would prefer and i do believe that this is a huge distinction a lot of people dive right into the financial modeling and the spreadsheets and all of that. And we do cover that, but I'm really focused on you as an individual, not on the spreadsheet that you're going to be working. Nobody has ever come back to me and said, I bought a bad business because I got the spreadsheet wrong, or I bought the wrong business for me because I got the spreadsheet wrong. It wasn't an issue with the spreadsheet. It was typically an issue within them. If they had had time and the coaching, they might've been able to avoid it. And Vault, you have well over a hundred videos. Is that correct? hundred no, interviews? No, 2000, David. Okay, 2000. That's I know. Uh, I, well, significant. You know, 
when we first started, I thought, well, I've got like a hundred plus and maybe there's a couple hundred out there with this person, like a hundred or two with that person and 50 over here. And I was thinking, oh, we have like maybe 500 videos involved and now it's uh, 2000. So Amazing. I'm really glad we got some AI behind it because right. uh, it makes it work well. And you've spoken to everyone uh, about everything. And people can search by topic if they want to look for something specific in that library. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So it is indexed by stage of search by uh, contributors. So we have special contributors like Walker Diebel and others uh, there. So you can go through that index and you can also search. So if you have a question, you can put in a search term and the most relevant videos will come up. And, and there's some really nifty features with chapterizing of each of the videos and being able to go straight to the transcripts and straight to the point of the video. So some pretty nifty features there. So basically it's your one-stop shop for knowledge. Uh, they, so even if people aren't in an accelerator or your pre-accelerator, they can sign up for the vault and get a bunch. It's like having a smart library almost uh, okay. where they can get a lot of the knowledge, not just passively, but also know who to talk to uh, if they have follow-up questions. Is that right? Exactly. And, and one of the reasons why I created Vault was I realized so much of the knowledge of the search fund space is not necessarily written. It's in video. It's in the stories that people tell. And I'm, of course, most interested in the things where things went wrong, even if they ended up being successful. I want to know, okay, what went wrong and what would you do differently? And, and, and that's all in video. And you have a seven day free trial. So people could just try it out. If they're looking for uh, cheating the system, they can go on and say, I want these three questions answered and drill down and get all that for free. But if they find that uh, they want to take multiple sips, if you will, uh, they can just sign up for a recurring subscription. Yep. And Search Funder members get a discount uh, using the code Search Funder. So it makes Great. it really, really easy. And everything is at fetchstrategies.com. Is yes. there anywhere else you'd like to point people? Uh, Fetch is my main site. That's where I do my consulting and my coaching. And I can, it'll send you to the courses. It'll send you to Vault. Uh, it sort of encapsulates everything that I do. And I'm so, I'm so proud of how everything's turned out. It's been a lot of work to put this much content in. And you know, David, uh, from your experience helping me with uh, editing my book as I was writing it, uh, how much labor intensive it can be. It was a pleasure. I learned a lot. It, uh, it, oh yeah, one of my best, best decisions ever. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, it's, the feeling's mutual. Uh, looking into 2025, which is fast approaching, quarter of the way through this new century, uh, what's one thing that you'd like to see in this space? Because it seems like change is happening so quickly these days. Um, you have a lot of experience going into this. I'm just curious, what, what would you like to see uh, be accomplished in the ETA world uh, in 2025? I would like to see more folks outside of the usual MBA programs coming into the search fund space. I would love to see more women, more people of color generally. And now I'm talking about the US. I think when it comes to looking more globally, I'd like to see more connection between searchers who are in other countries to the US and and even amongst each other, I, I'm not getting the sense that outside of, say, the big uh, IESA conference that's coming up in October, that, that there's a lot of knowledge transfer happening. Many of these uh, searchers who are in countries that are at the earlier stages that the US was at, say, seven years ago or five years ago, can probably do a lot of learning from the US. And so I, I would hope that there would be more of that sharing going on and a little bit more of a look internationally. I, I do believe that for investors coming in that they should consider international and investment in searchers along with domestic investment. Mm. 
Okay, I think that's achievable. Uh, certainly with more people creating content about the space and sharing some of these stories and we're all in this together, it's becoming more and more apparent. So um, looking at your background, you've take, you've gone bi-coastal and different, uh, completely different industries uh, and yet you bring it all together into this unique way that um, you can share your knowledge with others. And uh, one thing that I really liked about the search fund space is how collegial it is and how, what a growth mindset, um, like everyone seems to have that growth mindset. Um, it's very positive and uh, it's challenging. That's another thing that, um, you know, no one, no one really hides that, but it, you're also in this together. And so that, uh, that can really help you. You and I both lived in Japan and that's uh, something that I noticed the Japanese do really well is um, that sense of community. Um, you, you can accomplish a lot more as a group than you can as an individual. And I definitely hope that as the ecosystem grows, that that will be the one thing that remains is that culture. I, I do know folks are, some folks are less optimistic about it than I am, but I, I do believe that the culture has led to the success. And so keeping that culture is gonna be important for everybody. Here, here. Well, thank you, Karen. It was a pleasure speaking to you again. I look forward to our, our next round when I'm sure there'll be even more things to, to celebrate and discover. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me on and uh, I'll come back whenever you want, David.